In the 12th century, a magical story began to circulate in France. Told by troubadours and poets, written down by scribes, it was an epic tale of chivalry and adventure. It was the story of a young man called Percival and his search for a magical vessel. This priceless object was surrounded by danger, but on those who could penetrate its mysteries, it would shower divine grace, healing, and happiness. This film is the story of that legend, of the dreams that created it, the dreams it inspired, and of two men whose lives it touched. It is a story of the fine line between heavenly inspiration and real horror. It is a story of the ultimate treasure quest, the ultimate obsession, the search for the Holy Grail. Mystery layered upon mystery. This is the nature of the Grail. The first writer of the story says it's a platter which magically produces food. Another writes that it is a luminous stone. Only in later centuries will people believe it is the cup that held Christ's blood. The only thing to be said for certain about the Grail is that it is a vessel, a mystical container pregnant with meaning and power. Perhaps this is why it has obsessed men so. The Grail is the ultimate enigma. All versions of the story are in accord. Only a hero of absolute pure-heartedness who has atoned for his sins, will ever be able to hold it. The only way to understand the true power of the Holy Grail is to understand the era that produced it. We know of nobody in the 12th century who believed the Holy Grail really existed. But it was an era of quests, of crusades to liberate the Holy Land from Islam, of searches for lost relics, of the quest for honor and redemption. From all these real-life searches emerges the myth of the Holy Grail. At the center of the tumultuous era which produced the story of the Grail is the great crusading, questing knight of medieval Europe, King Richard I of England and France, Richard the Lionheart. Richard was born in 1158, son of Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine. He would inherit the Angevin Empire, England and most of Western France. Richard was French to the core. Throughout his life, he wrote poetry in French and Provençal. He could crack jokes in Latin. He could barely speak a word of English. He grew up in his mother's castles in France, surrounded by her world of courtly refinement. He was her favorite son. He absorbed the values she held high, art, honor, and chivalry. 
chivalry. The idea of the brave warrior knight on a holy quest was the obsession of his age. Its dictates would inspire both the Grail legends and Richard's real-life quest, to the point where his life, hauntingly, would seem to imitate art. The interweaving of Richard's life and the life of the Grail legend starts with a strange coincidence. The first Grail legend was written by a poet who actually graced the castles of Richard's youth. His name was Cretien. Cretien set out to write an epic adventure story about a wild boy named Percival who searches for a heavenly treasure called the Grail. Through the hardships of his quest, and finally atonement for his sins, Percival learns the lessons of chivalry and is transformed into a true knight. This quest for knighthood was Richard's quest too. It started early. In 1179, at the age of 21, Richard took command of a contingent of troops and laid siege to the forces of a rebellious baron in the heavily fortified town of Tybur. Through a combination of near suicidal bravery and tactical brilliance, he took the town. He slaughtered many of its inhabitants and then demolished Tybur stone by stone. His reputation as one of the most fearsome warrior knights of his era was established. It would follow him for the rest of his life. He soon earned other reputations. In 1183, infuriated local barons claimed he was in the habit of kidnapping their wives and daughters, and when he had his way, handing them down to become his soldiers' whores. He acknowledged at least one illegitimate child. There may have been others. Richard, it is clear, had sins to atone for. But perhaps the event which really started his quest stemmed from the bitter disintegration of his family. His parents split up in 1167. Fed up with her husband's infidelities, Eleanor withdrew to France with her sons. Henry became convinced, rightly as it turned out, that Eleanor was turning his sons against him. Not one for half measures, Henry had her imprisoned. Richard was upset, then furious. He allied himself with his father's enemies and broke into open rebellion. It was war. The armies of father and son clashed in northern France. The old man was already ill and in no condition to lead a campaign. His armies were routed. Richard forced his father into a humiliating surrender. Shortly afterwards, Henry died. So in 1189, in these bitterest of circumstances, 
Richard became king of England, a country he didn't like, hardly knew, and in which he had no interest. Having virtually killed his father, Richard was overtaken by grief and a deep sense of his moral failings. Already prone to bouts of extreme remorse, Richard now, not surprisingly, had another one. He stripped to the waist and publicly whipped himself, confessing his many sins. And he did so with great humility and heartfelt contrition. Richard recalled the many abominations of his life. He renounced his sins and implored a divine penitence from the bishops who were present. Benedict of Peterborough. Richard, I'm sure, was himself worried by his sins. It was an age in which people were drawn to piety. Now, it is not, of course, that people in the 12th century behaved any better than people in the 20th or 21st century do. The difference is they worried about the way they behaved. We have to consider a world in which people were capable of, of great acts of brutality, but at the same time could be pious. The concept of pious violence is a reality, and, and without it, of course, the Crusades don't make much sense. The chivalrous search for purity, reflected so beautifully in the legend of the Grail, in reality culminated in the Crusades which dominated Richard's era. He was made for them. Wild, courageous, prone to violence, but desperately questing for atonement. Luckily for Richard, a crusade was underway. In 1187, when Richard was 29 and just about to become king of England, the Muslim forces of the warlord Saladin had overwhelmed the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem. Christianity's two most valuable relics had been lost. The Holy Sepulchre and a fragment of the True Cross. These relics were the lifeblood of medieval Christianity. Their loss was a devastating blow to believers in Europe. So you have the cave in which Christ's dead body was laid and from which he resurrected. You have the wood down which the blood of Christ flowed at the crucifixion. Lost. And that theme in Grail story of searching, of searching for something that is lost, uh, the, that seems to me to be inspired at least partly by these very profound losses that Christendom had suffered in 1187. The legend of the Holy Grail is the great myth of the Crusades. Percival's quest for the Holy Grail, like Richard's quest to restore the relics of the Holy Land, is the quest for a lost connection with God. Percival wanders on his chivalrous adventures until finally he comes across the Fisher King, guardian of the Grail, who suffers from a mysterious and agonizing wound. It can only be healed by a pure-hearted young hero who asked the question, whom does the grail serve? The king invites Percival into his castle to eat, rest, and hopefully ask the question of the grail. That night, as the unsuspecting young knight dines, he is astonished to see a strange procession pass in front of his table. 
At its rear comes a maiden carrying a mysterious glowing vessel. Percival stares and says nothing. The next day, he wakes up to find the castle deserted. Only later, on his travels, does he learn how he has failed. Granted a vision of the most mystical and sought-after object in the universe, he had been struck dumb. If only he had asked the question, the Grail would have showered all its blessings on him, and the sufferings of the Fisher King would have come to an end. For years, Percival wanders on, ashamed of his silence. He does chivalrous deeds, but none of them bring him closer to the Grail and its promise of heavenly grace. He forgets and devotes himself to combat. And this was precisely Richard's situation in 1190, as he set off for the Holy Land on the Third Crusade. Like all crusaders, he wanted to retrieve Christendom's lost relics, and in the process, earn the remission of his sins. This had been promised to all crusaders since the first crusade a hundred years earlier. O oh, mighty soldier, O oh, man of war, you now have a cause for which you can fight without endangering your soul. A cause in which to win is glorious, and for which to die is but gain. I can offer you a splendid bargain. Take the sign of the cross. At once you will have indulgence for all the sins which you confess with a contrite heart. It does not cost you much to buy, and it is worth the kingdom of heaven. Bernard of Clairvaux. To kill infidels and die oneself in the struggle for Jerusalem was to earn a ringside seat for the Day of Judgment. When the heavenly Jerusalem with its walls of jasper and gates of pearl, would descend to earth. These, we must assume, were the thoughts on Richard's mind as he headed for the Holy Land. It took Richard almost a year to get to the Holy Land, overland through France, and then along the coasts of the Mediterranean. When Richard finally arrived in Palestine in 1191, his reputation for bravery, impulsiveness, and brilliant strategy had preceded him. The charisma of England's new king was at its zenith. He immediately took charge of the chaotic force of European crusaders who were already there and shaped them into a formidable fighting force. Two months after arriving, Richard captured the vital port of Acre from Saladin's forces, along with several thousand Saracen defenders. Richard entered into lengthy negotiations with Saladin to arrange the formal surrender of the Muslim forces of Acre. For the return of the Muslim hostages, he wanted money from Saladin and the relic, the fragment of the true cross. Saladin realized the relic was his greatest bargaining chip. He kept promising to hand it over, 
but never did. Finally, in exasperation, Richard showed just how breathtaking his ruthlessness could be. He had the hostages executed, one by one, in sight of Saladin's forces. Over 2,000 of them. Was this the true meaning of chivalry and knighthood? The Third Crusade seemed to be degenerating into a brutal, bloody, and senseless waste of time. For the next year, Richard tried fruitlessly to liberate Jerusalem. He was turned back again and again by Saladin's forces. To make matters worse, the Crusaders were fighting among themselves as greed and frustration took over. Richard fell ill and was overcome by despair. He had not taken communion since the death of his father, convinced he was unworthy of it. Honor, redemption, and grace, all the things promised by the crusade, were nowhere in sight. Richard's quest, like Percival's in the Grail legend, seemed to be failing on every front. In the story, of course, there is a happy ending which reveals the true meaning of the quest. After wandering for years, weary and despairing, Percival comes upon a hermit who takes him in. He explains to Percival that the true search for the Grail is not out there in the world, but in your own soul. Only the pure of heart, who have fully repented of their sins, can penetrate the mysteries of the Grail. It's really a symbol of Christ, a Eucharistic symbol. It's the symbol of divine grace. Percival meditates, prays, renounces the world, purifies his soul. Finally, he is ushered back to the castle of the Grail and asks the question. The Fisher King is cured. The world is set to rights, and Percival himself becomes the guardian of the Grail. The end of Richard's story, like all real-life stories, is not as simple as myth. But with his quest in the Holy Land going nowhere, Richard too heard of a hermit. The man had lived for years in a cave and was said to have the gift of prophecy. Richard went to see him. The hermit told Richard he would never retake Jerusalem. The time was not right, but then reached under some stones at the back of the cave. He told Richard it was a fragment of the true cross and gave it to him. Richard was overwhelmed by emotion. For seven days, he stayed with the hermit until the old man died. Within months, he gave up his crusade. Richard returned to France and took up the politics of his kingdom where he had left them. Was he, like Percival, purified by his quest? We have no way of knowing. Seven years later, in yet another skirmish with a rebellious nobleman, he was struck by an arrow in the shoulder. Gangrene set in. Soon, it was clear Richard wasn't going to survive. He sent messages to the many enemies he had made through his brutal actions, begging their forgiveness. He finally took communion, and on April 6, 1199, he died, apparently at peace. He was 41. 
Richard was mourned throughout Europe. In England, he became a national hero, even though he had only spent a total of six months there in his entire life. Everywhere, the legend of Richard the Lionheart grew. At the same time and same pace, the legends of the Holy Grail spread throughout Europe. At the time of Richard's death, another poet in Germany sat down to write perhaps the greatest grail legend of them all. His name was Wolfram von Eschenbach. He called his story Parzifal, German for Percival. Alone among all the grail legends, his was a protest against the Crusades. His Parzifal has a brother who is a Muslim. Parzival's quest for the Grail is also a quest for his long-lost brother. Wolfram's story is a hymn to religious toleration between Christian and Muslim. The purity required by his Grail is the purity of a loving spirit. Sadly, that was not the spirit of his times. The spread of the Grail legends in the 13th century coincided exactly with the growth of religious intolerance and political repression in Europe. Why? It's very simple. By means of adventure stories, which were entertainments, but not innocent entertainments, the Church mobilized the Christian knighthood in the defense of the faith against all its enemies, infidels, Jews, and heretics. Soon Jews and heretics within Europe found themselves the targets of crusades. The Holy Grail became the symbol of these internal crusades, too. Here it stood not for Wolfram's purity of a loving spirit, but the purity of racial and religious cleansing. The seeds of the Inquisition were being sown. A feature of holy war, whether Islamic holy war or Christian holy war, is that it invariably turns on the society which creates it. It's absolutely invariable, wherever you look, that sooner or later, people will say, we cannot win this battle against an outside enemy unless the society we represent is purified, is uniformly religious, and the whole thing turns in on itself. Europe's attempts to purge itself all led to a fateful event in the territory of the Cathars, a peace-loving Christian sect who lived in the south of France. Their citadel was the fortress of Mont Segur in the foothills of the Pyrenees. In 1244, on the orders of the church, it was besieged by crusaders. On March 29th, its inhabitants surrendered and were fed en masse to the bonfires of the new Christian orthodoxy. Almost 700 years later, in 1931, a young man explores the ruins of Mont Segur, searching for clues to the forgotten life of the Cathars. Otto Rahn is hunting for the Holy Grail. His quest will tread a knife's edge between inspiration and nightmare, a fate common to seekers of the Grail. In my opinion, Otto Rahn was a great dreamer, a great romantic, who had ideas, but who seems to have been crushed by history. Otto Rahn was a writer and historian. He arrived in the small town of Montsegur in the autumn of 1931. He was German, 
although he spoke French fluently. He was outgoing, energetic, and soon made friends among the locals. He clearly already knew a great deal about the history of the area. Now he fell in love with it. He spent weeks at the ruined fortress and hiking in the Pyrenean foothills beyond. It was a welcome respite from the troubles of his life in Germany. Otto, a kindly and sensitive soul, had just lived through the Depression and been cruelly marked by it. The Germany in which he had grown up was crushed and humiliated in the aftermath of the First World War. The Depression of 1928 had brought it to the brink of collapse. Two million Germans were thrown out of work. Rioting and unrest broke out. But by 1930, the number of unemployed had grown to 16 million. Young people, students and intellectuals like Otto, were the worst hit. Otto abandoned his studies and soon found himself destitute. To add to his difficulties, Otto was a homosexual, which in 1920s Germany meant that much of his life had to be lived in concealment. Whatever the cost, Otto was determined to continue his research and be a writer. The influence of the crash is one that really we see him living in extremis, trying to do everything to break through as a writer. And he went down to Geneva in Switzerland, where he eked out a very miserable living in an unheated room without running water, teaching languages. But at the same time, he was writing busily on um, Inquisition and um, uh, Crusades and these sorts of medieval subjects in the hope that he would eventually break through as a writer. And this was finally what brought him to Montségur. He believed that the Cathars of Mont Segur had been guardians of a secret knowledge based around the worship of the Holy Grail. If Europe was ever to break free of its history of violence and persecution, this secret tradition of the Grail had to be rediscovered. He, Otto Rahn, was determined to do it. His inspiration, his Bible, was Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parzival. His Swiss friend Paul Ladam remembered his enthusiasm. He said it was there, the key to the whole of Western civilization. Its secret message, properly understood, could unify Europe forever in complete political equality and under the reign of a single religion, tolerant, ecumenical and embracing all the others the Cathar religion, the original Christianity of the Grail. Otto was convinced that Wolfram's Holy Grail really existed, and that the Cathars had guarded it at Mont Segur. He believed that when the Inquisition had destroyed them in 1244, some of the Grail's guardians had perhaps escaped and hidden it in the caves below the fortress. Otto was on Parsifal's quest to bring healing to Europe, which, like the kingdom of the Fisher King, was desolate and broken-spirited. He spent weeks in the huge caves of Sabartes beneath the Pyrenees. 
hoping that here he would find traces of the Cathars and their religion of the Grail. And he was sure he found them in the signs and graffiti that covered the cave's walls. His days and nights in the Pyrenees were spent frantically searching for the Holy Grail that would bring healing and redemption to his ravaged world. After months of research in southern France, Otto reluctantly left Montségur in 1932. Still destitute, but as obsessed by his studies as ever, Otto ended up in Paris, where he wrote up his researches. The resulting book was called The Crusade Against the Grail. It was clearly a labor of love. He'd immersed himself in the Cathar stories and the stories of the Albigensian Crusade. He immersed himself in uh, 12th and 13th century. All this history is recorded by Otto Rahn in a very readable, very um, sort of delicious, colourful way. This is someone who was able to combine scholarship with a very nice written style. It was published in Freiburg, Germany in 1933. All of Otto's hopes were pinned on this book. They were cruelly dashed. The copies it sold didn't even begin to clear his debts. I think really the implication is that Otto Rahn found it very difficult to survive between 1932 and uh, early 1935. Um, he's just living in pension and is very down at heel. He's got no regular income whatsoever. Then, an invitation arrived out of the blue from someone he didn't know in Berlin. This person said he'd been impressed by Otto's book on the Holy Grail and wanted to fund more research on the subject. Excited, Otto raced to Berlin in a meeting with his mysterious benefactor. He was graciously received at number 7 Prince Albertstrasse, by a small man in a black uniform. He repeated that he'd been intrigued by Otto's book on the Holy Grail. He wanted to pay Otto a salary to write more of the same. The little man was Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, architect of the Final Solution, virulent racist and homophobe. Two years earlier, in 1933, Adolf Hitler had taken control of the Reichstag and all Germany. His National Socialist Party had become the best organized and most efficient political machine in Europe. To the battered and poverty-stricken people of Germany, it seemed to offer renewed pride and the real prospect of an economic and national renewal. At the core of the Nazi party was the SS, headed by Heinrich Himmler. They were meant to be the soul of the new Germany, immaculate Aryan warriors, pure in body and mind. They were charged with reorganizing the cultural life of Germany around the doctrine of racial purity. The problem is this. How can we arrest racial decay? Shall we form an order, a new brotherhood of Templars around the holy grail of the pure blood? Adolf Hitler. 
There were occult believers in Nazism who thought the Grail had once belonged to the Aryans, who had lost it because of racial intermingling. If only they could recover it, they thought the Grail's magical powers would once again be theirs. Himmler was a fanatic of Grail mysticism. He even went so far as to have a medieval castle rebuilt at Wevelsburg, where the heads of the SS were to meet around a round table like the Knights of Old. He believed that Nazism was not just another political party, but a mystical quest for the destiny of the long-suppressed German people. And this was where Otto came in. Why should the Holy Grail be of interest to Himmler? Well, of course, it's, it's an object of power, rather like um, the Holy Spear that pierced the side of Christ, you might say. Enter a young man like Otto Rahn, who's researching the Cathars and the Grail. It's a heaven-sent opportunity to recruit and employ a house intellectual on those very subjects. Otto knew little about the Nazis or the SS. It was 1935. He only knew that Germany was emerging with stunning speed from the Depression, and that finally he was being recognized for his work. He accepted Himmler's invitation. In those first months, he swam in happiness. For the first time in his life, he was rich. But little by little, he began to feel a new anxiety. It was clear that his new masters wanted something more from him in exchange for their generosity. Paul the Dam. They wanted another book on the Holy Grail by the spring of 37, then another in 39. And they made him understand the ideas in these books had to be the right ones. As his first deadline approached, Paul Le Dam received a note of alarm. I have written many things just to please them, he told me. I am ashamed, but what else can I do? They've got me. I'm their slave. too well about the Nazi party. It controlled every aspect of the nation's life. Otto's too. In the summer of 1936, Otto met his old friend Paul Le Dam in Berlin. Paul Le Dam is just strolling down the Kurfürstendamm and he suddenly sees this almost familiar figure, Otto Rahn, wearing an SS uniform. Before he even greets him, he says, Otto, what are you doing wearing this uniform? Otto Rahn looks to the right and then the left, obviously embarrassed and says, Paul, one's got to feed. Despite an absence of a few years from Germany, I consider myself to now be irreproachably well instructed in the political line and objectives in terms of ways of conceiving and understanding the world of the National Socialist Party of Germany. I have written a book and articles which I hope represent a patrimony of National Socialist thought. Signed, Otto Rahn. Parzival's failure at his first sight of the Grail was not to ask the question, whom does the Grail serve? With his books, Himmler's favorite bedside reading Otto was clearly failing to ask that question, too. 
Once, he had been on Parsifal's quest, eager to bring healing and redemption to his land. Yearning for a glimpse of the Grail and its mystical grace. For the Grail was the fruit of blessedness, such abundance of the sweetness of the world that its delights were very like what we are told of the Kingdom of Heaven. Heaven was not where Otto's quest was now leading him. Otto was drinking heavily, and suspicions of his homosexuality were beginning to circulate in the SS. As punishment, in September 1937, he was ordered to do four months SS guard duty at one of the new internment camps. It was called Dachau. It was in Dachau that Otto must have realized he had made a pact with the devil. The camp was full of intellectuals, Jews and homosexuals. Otto decided on a final desperate plan to save himself. On 17th of June, he writes to Himmler personally to say that he has found a bride, that she's divorced and she's got a four and a half year old boy who's a sort of radiant little blonde. Of course, that would earn brownie points with Himmler. The point about that marriage is that it would have erased the last hint, if you like, of Otto Rahn's unreliability as a suspected homosexual. Otto's plan backfired. In December 1938, he displeased Himmler even more by saying the marriage was off. Finally, Otto seems to have realized his deceptions could not continue. Unhappily, I must ask you to intervene with the chief of the SS to secure my immediate dismissal from the SS. The reasons that have led me to this resolution and decision are of so grave a nature that I can only give them to you orally. Signed, Otto Rahn. The so grave reasons he gave them, we can only guess at. Did he tell them the truth? Whatever it was, they didn't like it. Otto Rahn visited his friends in Dortmund, and he was in a completely distraught condition. And Rahn actually said, in the presence of one of his former editors, that um, he'd been given a straight choice. Um, he, he could either basically finish his days in a, in a concentration camp, this time as an inmate, or he could find an honorable death. On March 14, 1939, the same day that German troops marched into Czechoslovakia, Otto was seen walking alone into the mountains near Kufstein in Bavaria. Otto had once dreamt of holding the Grail and releasing its healing grace upon the world.
the locals of Kufstein said they found Otto the next day, frozen in the snow, two small medicine bottles empty by his side. The SS released a statement saying he died in a hiking accident. And from that point, the myths of Otto Rahn, like the myths of the Grail, grew. There were those who said he had never died at all, but changed his name, stayed in the SS, and went on hunting for the Grail. Some said he found it. The truth of Otto's life became as elusive as the search for the Grail. They both lie somewhere between real horror and heavenly inspiration. Upon a deep pillow, she bore the perfection of paradise. That was the thing called the Grail, which surpasses all earthly perfection. Mm -hmm. 